just going to share the screen a little bit. And while I'm doing this, um, I just want to thank the organizers of this series. I think it's really important to showcase the research of young scholars. Uh, so far, the conversations have been great. And I'm just going to say that I'm a huge fan of Alison. Like, I'm a little bit of, uh, um, I don't know, a fan a little bit. So I'm a little bit nervous too. Um, let me start by situating my conversation. I'm from Oaxaca de Juarez, which is a, a state at the south part of Mexico. And I'm sharing with you some of the amazing, amazing poets that I follow. So if we're gonna talk about uh, justice through poetry, then we need to talk about all of the conversations that we have with each other. And in, in this sense, these three of them are really important. You can Google them. Most of her work, their work is already uh, translated into English. So that's going to be great. And then the second thing that I want to situate is the idea that we are constantly in a struggle. Right now in Mexico, at the federal level, we are actually fighting against a federal law that is trying to bring back a lot of the ableist uh, understandings of mental health. So that is also a shout out into the saying that into conversations, academic conversations, there's political uh, realities that we need to bring about, especially in relation to autism, because when the, in, two, in 2015, when the general law on attention and protection of people with uh, in the autistic uh, spectrum passed, um, they didn't include any uh, autistic person. So that's really important that now the conversation is how are we gonna be included rather than can we be included, right? So I'm gonna, I changed a little bit of the presentation. So now I'm gonna concentrate a little bit more on what autistic preparations might look like in the classroom. And I'm gonna show a little bit about how fictional international relations it's important to try to create reparations and actually a good way to think about what in terms of theory and practice of the hurt has been inflicted into um, autistic people. So to try to start the conversation, I'm gonna tell you a poem that I think is really important and you can write questions and, and think about that later. So the poem is the following. It's called, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I keep failing up. I'm sorry I'm smart but can, can't get out of bed. I'm sorry I fantasize about killing myself instead of doing homework. I'm sorry I don't go out. I'm sorry I don't understand people. I'm sorry I don't have any one day long good moments. I'm sorry I lied and I said I was okay. I'm sorry. I'm so afraid of trying because I know I won't be able to make it. I'm sorry she killed herself. I'm sorry she has been my only friend. I'm sorry he died when I started to love him. I'm sorry he wasn't a girl. I'm sorry I didn't feel anything when my father died. I'm sorry I hated you because you couldn't protect me. I'm sorry I smile and run away. I'm sorry I stop saying what I truly think. I'm sorry I don't trust you anymore. I'm sorry I'm sick. I'm sorry there's nothing you can do. I'm sorry I can reach my potential. I'm sorry I don't care anymore. I'm sorry I can be a model for autistic kids. I'm sorry, this is my life. I'm sorry, this is my life. So I wrote this poem when I, years ago, when I was an international relations student, undergraduate student at a Mexican university. At the time I was crying and deciding whether I should just quit. This poem tells a story some of us marked by autism and working in IR prefer to live out of our academic narratives. To let our accomplishments speaks for themselves and for ourselves. For years, we were terrified and some continue to be terrified to mention in public and more on print 
that we are autistic. This is the case because the socioeconomic ecosystems we move and in and through can be and sadly have been unforgiving and unaccommodating to mental and physical diversities. We are constantly negotiating university and world systems and funding, of course, that can and have shifted their position on autism from a commodifiable diversity mark or a challenge we were or we are able to conquest on or triumph. And they have changed it to a personal flaw that endangers us and those around us, or that it is much more of a liability that cannot be accepted or higher. The we in this paragraph or in this uh, introductory paragraph reflects the collective thinking I have had in common unity with people marked by autism in, out, and in relation to the sociological economies of IR. The poem was inspired by Islam poetry. This artistic model is a way of resistance that I felt for the first time in English through YouTube videos, especially a YouTube channel that I love that is a special bottom. Especially, uh, this is bottom poetry, right? Later, I understood that those videos were part of an international movement of spoken words, organizing national and international presentation, workshops, laboratories, conferences, talks, and more. A slam poem is a combination of free prose, activism, theater, community, therapy, and recreation. It is both an art form and a performance. It is designed to be shared in public, usually in common unity, and each delivery is mediated by theatrical enactments. I invite any, everyone to just take a photo of the poem and try to perform it out loud, um, feeling all of the poetry run through their bodies and then let the performance become you, but then run away because of all of the message that it is in the poem. Maybe we can do that later on. What I'm gonna talk about today takes a poem as its departure um, because its content demonstrates that people marked by autism exist are made, and are made to resist in IR. At the same time, the verses and the enactments out loud by any one of you present and the, the one that I said by now, show how poetry can be therapeutic um, to move people away from debilitating and unjust effects. And by doing so, poetry can help construct a different world of worlds. Then in, in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna argue that IR has a historical debt with the students marked by autism, that this historical debt entails epistemic and material harm for autistic people including the intellectual disregard for artistic questions and the lack of care for artistic disappearances and displacements. As an alternative to this state of affairs, I'm gonna demonstrate how the field of fictional international relations offer a path for artistic preparations based on the creative writing of people marked by autism across borders. So in what follows, the plan is the following, is just tell you a little bit about autism as a place for world politics. Then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, what is the heart in theory and practice of autism in IR. And then mostly like showing you where to go if you want to learn deeper these things. Then I'm gonna introduce you to fictional and international relations. And I'm gonna tell you just one quick thing about the relation of fiction and imagination as a theory-oriented uh, approach to what autism can bring to international relations through critical disability studies. And then maybe if I have the time, read a little bit more. So in autistic, autism and international relations is, is the clearly connected across all of the main topics of the discipline. So think about how the state and sovereignty are embedded into autism is to think about all of the politics 
as the the ones that I mentioned at the beginning that that mark the connection between um, autism and the state and how the state has to op operate. What for me is really important is to think about um, how the state is right now constructed as a way to actually include people into every single uh, piece, uh, pay, um, a step of the conversation. And I'm, wor and I'm always wor worried and a little bit questioned by why is it that academia doesn't include them, right? So I put some of the references because I think it's really important to give visibility to the people in political science and international relations who are thinking about these ideas. I think political science has been doing a, a better job to understand um, autism as a place of politics and the location of politics because basically everything about autism is contested, right? So that sends the meaning um, to what does it what does it entail, like how has to be treated or mediated to all of the politics that go again uh, around it. Dana Lee Baker and through the Estel Nagel have been really good at demonstrating the role of individuals into the making of, in, of autistic politics in both Canada and the US. Uh, John Pitney in, in, in his book actually argued that autism was a place of politics. And we have a couple of books, a, a couple of papers and hopefully a book coming by Felipe Jaramillo Ruiz about the importance of this disability for international human rights movement uh, frameworks. And then we have some work about the role of autistic, of this disabled people on the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, just to mention some of the lines of thought that we can go in IR is an autism. Also, it's related to international markets. There's a lot of work right now, really interesting work on the relation between um, disability in general and, and neoliberal politics. Here are some of the people who are, are thinking of those relations in international relations, thinking a lot about the relation of disability studies and development studies, disability and relations of, poet, of poverty. And there, there's the colonial legacies that are embedded in the making of disability, um, disability and disability studies. And then there's the idea of how we can implement and if it's good or bad that we have all of these really neoliberal um, base and actually charge and colonial, we can say um, systems to deal with, uh, with disability and I'm thinking all of this in relation to autism. So there's lines of research there just to think about a little bit about the relation. And because Ali is here, I have to think about international security a lot. Um, and I think the one who has addressed autism specifically is, is James Eastwood in, in, the, in the amazing paper of Enable Militarism, making a connection between critical disability studies and militarism and actually seeing how, for example, autistic people are really included in the state security framework through the um, creation of a special forces uh, that, uh, that are just for autistic people and that are related to quite um, uh, wrong characterizations of what autistic people might be in general. Right, so just reducing what the diversity of autism can be to just someone who is ready to serve the military, right, and state. Um, and then I put a lot of other um, references just so people know that there's a lot of people thinking about international security and disability and the possibilities of autism. Now I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on what are the bonds. Um, Gladly, we have a, a paper already the, of Stephen Mitchell Christian telling us a lot about autism and in, in international relations. Um, he mapped a lot of the uses of autism in international relations texts. And he argued that most of the uses that autism has had in international relations have been ableist, meaning 
people um, use autism as a punch bag to something that they thought that was wrong, right? And something that needed to be if, cured or something that needed to uh, remain in a really compact category disregarding the huge diversity that autistic experiences can be. So I'm not gonna talk about all of this is epistemic violence too much, but I'm gonna concentrate a little bit more on the sociological economies of academic institutions. And, think, and here I will say that most of the thinking that I have in relation to these two things are in relation to the suicide of um, Will Moore. Um, you can know a little bit about the story in this page. And what I think is really important is how he mapped as a tenure professor uh, where it's still the punch um, out and all of the misfitting categories that the discipline of interaction relation creates. And I think it's really important how that specific case has resonated with a lot of us doing international relations. I put a, a couple of uh, other references. Alison Howell has a really great uh, paper on the relation between the police, the university and disability. Um, and I actually built a little bit on that paper in an upcoming chapter that I talk a little bit about the militarism, autism and international relations. And of course, this socioeconomic um, frameworks are not the only experiences, right? And I, that's why I put also Patri to this Jackson, um, who's a really well-known scholar. He has his own take on uh, autism and international relations and actually offers more uh, nicer paths international relations. So let me just um, end this uh, theoretical discussion by showing you what fictional international relations is and how I see it can fit a, a really important contribution to reparations. So fictional international relations has many paths. I'm not gonna talk about the different takes on fiction and international. And international. I'm just gonna mention one important intervention by Sunju Park Khan. Um, he argued that fictional IR um, recognized that the line between fact and fiction can be blurred and has been blurred, or at least that fact, um, reality and fiction, imagination are interrelated. This is a little bit of a different approach to some of the other approaches. For example, um, Elizabeth Dunfin argued that um, we have to think about fiction as already existing in all IR, which I, I think is really important to think about how fiction is already embedded on, the, on all of our experiences and a little bit of the images that I have been showing through the presentation tells you a little bit of the same story about how uh, fictions, images, and, and this blur line between fact and fiction are actually in one or, or everyday practices already. And so one of the problems here is, well, for, Sunju, the main idea here was to introduce imagination as a really focal point to international relations and imagination was about um, filling empty spaces, right? And in this feeling of empty spaces, the problem or, or like the paradoxical position that arises is that we, if we know or think we know well enough or too much, then there is nothing left for imagination to work with we are thinking about is feeling something. For me, uh, Park Khan's definition of imagination applies because its purpose of everything that I'm doing here is to fill out the lack of enough ideas and information in IR about how autistic characters and people with autistic behavior um, work outside of ableist narratives I suggest that it is imaginative because the emphasis is not on the character's behavior, but on the complexities of living as a character, 
or as a person marked by autism within an ableist world. Contingencies can be shown really important, for example, in the, in the poem, because uh, first of all, like I'm thinking about autism through a lot of lo different locations and boundaries, North and South, material and representational constraint, disabled to able, unable narratives, love, hate, hope, hopelessness, and affections. All of the, in all of those descriptions, I actually um, shift the narratives of how autism relate to one of one of and the other boundary. And the second way you can see this imaginative process, I think, is that the, the poem, for example, suspends easy evaluations of what they could think it is, it is for us to do about what teaching people marked by autism, uh, raising a person with autism, being an autistic person, right? So it suspends a little bit about the idea of what is the good, but also raises questions about how and with whom the decisions about what counts as good, teaching, being, addressing are made within ableist settings and what able, ableism has been puzzled. And just to show that there's a lot of theoretical importance in this conversation, I'm just gonna mention one of the relations that I care a lot about, which is the relation between autism and imagination. Actually, this, this problem here that arises comes from mostly like a really ableist understanding of autism that frankly, it questions the idea of the accessibility of fiction to all of the people that participate in international relations. Why is this the case? Because as Ralph James Savaris has argued, autism is usually associated with a triumph of impairments in communication, imagination, and social interaction, suggesting that reading uh, literature, let alone writing it, will be a considerable challenge for autistic people. Similarly, Ilona Roth argued that the prevalent view is that imagination and self-awareness are impaired or even absent in autistic people. Then prose and poetry written by uh, people with in the autistic spectrum um, call for new investigation, right? On, on, this, on the imagination embedded in those poems. It seems like to write about oneself without self-awareness will seem as an oxymoron. And another theory could be that uh, the one of Bruce Mills claiming that understandings of imagination regularly undermine forms of creativity, of creativity stereotypically associated with people marked by autism, such as the facility to discern the sometimes subtle and distinct features of a discrete image activity of experience, and instead they will favor um, the capacity to move quickly to a more generalized or symbolic understanding. Right? So this idea of creativity as really, really, really narrow can have difficulties for autistic people. Of course, this has been challenged. I'm, I'm putting here the responses of the same authors, right? So we have that this imagination can be shown in the sense that in the, once you engage people with, with, with autism and, and in the autistic spectrum and with autistic traits, then you can see that, for example, sensory engagements, and just a strong feelings can be um, present in the narratives and poetry of people with autism. That the comparisons between the autistic and non and comparable non autistic poems just show that the idea that um, imagination and literary genius or uh, activity is actually not supported by the evidence. We can see a lot of people doing great work. Um, and put like the necessity of taking seriously that this all these medical and social um, deficiency theories of the mind because um, those, the analysis actually, like the uh, empirical analysis actually show that those assumptions, processes, and concepts 
uh, through the experience of people in the spectrum have um, revealed that they remain incomplete or unaccommodating to the continuum of imaginative process and acts, right? So we have all of this disability work that actually puzzles both the possibility and the inclusivity of international of a project of fictional international relations. But then we have all of the work that people within the spectrum has done through about creating their own definitions of imagination and creating their own political interests, their own political international relations subjects, curiosities and questions, right? Um, so this is like the example that because we are present and we are writing all of this um, thinking them, we actually challenge also in a different way. The idea that we cannot create anything imaginative or anything worth thinking about it as fictional. Um, and I'm gonna stop there a little bit. No, well, I'm just gonna read a little bit about a little bit about the the context of the poem. I still have time. I don't know. I can't stop or no, you, no, please go. You're good. You're good. So a little bit more narrative. So Um, I'm, I'm gonna go forward in time. Well, I survived. I stopped crying the night I wrote the poem. I managed to finish my degree. Now I am in a political science PhD program in the US with a big scholarship. I kept reading IR scholarship, yet I am tired and angry now. So let me reply to all of those people writing about autism in IR. I was a passing able kid in the classroom. Most of my teachers never noticed my red eyes for crying out all night. They did not question why I failed to deliver homework, even though I was getting the best grades in all my previous work. My parents also did not. Over time, you get tired of explaining and getting the same. You have to be tough. You have to understand that we are preparing you for the real world where you will not get accommodations. You will eventually understand that this system works because you have to generalize when you have many students with different strengths and interests and the classic answer, after few years of education, you will be free and happy to pursue the research you actually cared about. All of those are lies. Dear able people, I am already tough. See how many of us are here now. See how I and those that stay in universities do not scream in public anymore. I do not want accommodations. I do not want to preserve this world. Instead, I want to construct a world where differences and solidarities can be nurtured. I am not even sure that the world you are thinking about exists anymore or have ever existed. I know you must follow certain norms, but if we are challenging them, it is because they might not work for many, if not all students. The reason you haven't noticed is that these norms make you feel good. It is weird how some people get so much pleasure from being labeled as special. I guess being gifted because being an autistic person is not the same as being a gifted person for conforming with racist and sexist IR. I hate how professors good feelings sometimes translate into employing their power to make us invisible or label us as failures. Even if the same able system also loves the way some of us can be inventive, we can memorize faster, we can get the abstract and hard stuff easily. I know that we in all of this thinking is only me. But I love, a lot of IR speaks in universal language, their opinions and they pass it as theory, so I think it's okay. 
I love theory, by the way. What bothered me the most is how I know some tenured professors here in IR that struggle in similar ways. Some even recognize themselves as autistic people. I am surprised they have not done anything substantial to undermine ableism. Yet being perceived as an autistic person means I understand you. There are moments you cannot act even when you want to act. Sometimes your body does not respond. Sometimes habits and the past are too much, but we need to act because our friends keep getting murdered and because we are part of the problem by not being part of the solution. We should move from why we should care about autism in IR to how can we care about autism in IR. Repetition for clarity, for maybe for normative claims, for hope, fewer papers and more giving, giving time, giving grants, giving shelter, giving love. And, and now what? Well, let me end by saying when I started talking about this paper or about these ideas in public, I was constantly asked, why do you stay in IR? It sounds like an awful place to be. I always reply that there are always cracks in IR, openings here and there, brilliant scholarship that I cannot see elsewhere, Work, works telling stories of connection across borders, across oppressions, and across ways to say, I love you. But really, metaphorically, and I live in rooms for one or two days in many houses and many disciplines, but I have never found a colonial home. It's also true that when you don't have savings and you give too much, you end up with too little. With almost no room for academic movement. Now I'm hesitant maybe. Maybe it is precise that I'm, I am suicidal after all. Staying in IR is just another way of dying. I'm sorry, this is my death. I'm, I'm gonna finish there. Thank you. Hi, this is Ali Howell speaking. Um, after all, staying in IR is just another way of dying quote Julio's paper, which is exactly where you ended um, in your presentation. And my God, were truer words ever written. <laughs> um, after all, staying in IR is just another way of dying. So I, I interpreted these words not as a kind of uh, nihilism or defeatism. And even as they may express a kind of despair, I also read them as a kind of hail, um, an effort to accost IR uh, or IR scholars into ways of fostering different kinds of life and solidarities, maybe. So per Julio, we should move from why we should study autism in IR to how can we care about autism in IR. Um, now this is a paper that I found to be really like tense with resistance in the best sense of tension. And as I was reading it, um, this line from a poem kept uh, going through my head and I thought I would read it. Um, I know that, the, that Julio, you're um, grounded in uh, different poetic traditions than this poem, but I thought maybe it would connect. It's um, from the book Sling Slingshot by Saray Jarrell Johnson, who's um, a black autistic non-binary radical poet. And the poem is entitled, False Sonnet Embroidered with Four Local and and the line that was going through my head as I was reading your paper from this poem is, is as follows, and I'm not a poet, so you'll excuse my reading. <laughs> I'm a full grown whatever the fuck, and I will devour any attempt to subdue me with monstrous animality. And of course, there's this double play on whether the monstrous animality is, is part of the attempt to subdue or the act of devouring, right? Um, Julio's paper is wonderfully undisciplined. And I mean undisciplined in the best sense. It's an expression of the refusal of discipline, both in terms of structure of knowledge 
and kind of material apparatus of social control. Um, of course, it's also totally untrue that it's undisciplined because writing requires disciplining at a minimum over our bodies, even on a good day. And the paper contributes to all kinds of disciplinary lines of inquiry, such as fictional IR and, and beyond. And also the paper looks to and is um, deeply grounded in and um, extremely well-versed in alternate bodies of knowledge, um, especially emerging from critical disability studies that are disciplinary formations in their own right with, with its own dynamics and exclusions and so on. Now, many of us who are disabled or who experience ableism will have had at some point in some way to contend with being narrativized as brave. And those narratives are produced and then differently, of course, for queer crips, racialized crips, and so on. And by emphasizing the resistant qualities of the paper, I worry that I risk replicating those kinds of encounters in a kind of intellectualized way. Um, when I was reading the paper, I found myself having to check a persistent impulse to think of ways to discipline this paper so that it would find an easier route in the world, an easier route to publication. Um, and after all, um, we and Julio, you as its author, exist in material relations, that is hierarchies, uh, political economies that are, are not abstract, in which things like publication are, are a kind of currency. Um, still, my reading of this paper is that it isn't a paper that is asking for help or asking to be tamed. Right? It's a paper that is demanding and contributing to making better communities. Communities of IR, communities of disability justice and autism activism that center queers and people of color and that think and act beyond the US. So yes, um, it's animated by, a, by refusal, but also I think, and this is where the paper um, ends up, by a profound hopefulness. Um, about other ways of being and doing within and beyond the academy and IR, or of creating, in Julio's words, uh, IR with autistic people and autistic questions. So I was thinking about this paper in terms of the creative possibilities opened up both by the paper's resistant properties and its tensions with its investments in alternative futures of or beyond the discipline. So, so here are some questions. And um, you know, do with them what you will. Um, um, so my questions are how kind of like, like a question of how do you envisage your your audience or their experience of reading your work? And I wonder how you navigate what I see as a kind of implicit aim of your work, which is not just to reach an audience, but to change that audience, which is ex an extremely ambitious. Um, aim, right? And, and what I mean here is not just like changing people's minds through like argument, like through this kind of like intellectualization, I guess, but a kind of working on the audience. And, I, and I'm wondering if I have that right. Um, and, and if so, like, what does that mean about how you envisage your audience? I also wonder um, whether we might like kind of use this session to translate some of those lines of inquiry into practical questions. Um, questions like, how do we navigate intellectual or institutional spaces that are hostile? How can disability justice inform our answers to those questions? And um, as Julio suggests, can an IR with autistic people and autistic questions be produced? I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um... Uh, you know, I guess we'll just give this opportunity for you to reflect and respond to um, Ali's um, uh, reading and her comments or publications to you. And then audience members, if you have any questions or com comments, please do type in the question answer or raise your uh, Zoom hand if you want to ask it live. But you know, I'll pass the floor over to you now. Yes. Um, great observations, Ali. I think one of the points in this paper is that I'm not innocent and I don't pretend to be, right? 
So I'm participating in the exploitation of autism in an academic setting. And I know how powerful that might be, right? I also know how difficult it has been to publish this kind of articles in IR. Um, I have to have, like, I have to find the, the correct place to, to send it. Like maybe chap chapters, book chapters are really easier than, than to publish in, in the academic journals. The academic journal process has been tiring, especially because I persist and maybe I'm only able to write this quirky fictional writing, right? Instead of the other work that I also think that is really important about sovereignty, international markets and international security that I also know about and love, and that I don't write, I simply cannot write it. So in a sense, that's how I got the paper. And the second thing is that I don't think any autistic writing will do it. And I, and I have seen a lot of autistic people in IR, that's also a tension that it is inside in, in the paper that, that have been writing really, um, and unquestionable claims about autism and how it has to be dealt with, right? So in a sense that it's also intention. And I actually really love the question about how do you engage in the audience because I actually know what is one of the purposes of these papers is about um, changing behaviors and actually emphasize the need to act. And something that it is really hard and harder than just to act is to keep acting, right? It's, it's like this humanitarian that we can go and take pictures and, and be happy for a, a day, but how do you maintain a, a constant struggle, right? And in, in therefore, because we need a constant struggle, we need power and the type of power that we might need. Uh, and the one that I am suggesting here is, the, is a power that comes from the building of communities, right? And this question of what are we powerful in, right? And not just what, how we are not powerful, how we lack power, how we might be disabled, right? Um, so, so in that sense, that's important. Um, and I have prepared readings from autistic people. Right? So this is a, a, a very really important book by Leah Lakshmi Pietna Samarazinka, that is care work. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what has happened in, in, in the responses to a lot of the writing that I have done. It is, I've noticed ton of able activists will happily add ableism to the list of stuff they're against. You know, like the big sign in front of the club in my town that says, not racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism or throw around the word disability justice in the list of justices in their manifesto, but then nothing else changes. All their organizing is run the same exact way with the 10 mile long marches, workshops that urge people to get out of their seats and moves and lack of inclusion of any disabled issues or organizing strategies. And of course, None of them think they're ableists. Kicking cripples down the street, they never do that. They're just totally toothless about what disability justice is or indeed what disability is. And that is not bad. The problem is that they still silently believe that they'd rather die than be us. Think of disabled, sick or crazy people as flaky or inspirational, but also pathetic and gross. Don't know any disabled history and are still running. Shed the, the exact same way that makes or forces most of us to stay home. And just to, to shift it to know the, what disability justice can be. She, she has this really amazing response. You wanna know how you'll know if you're doing disability justice, you'll know you're doing it because people will show up late. Someone will vomit. Someone will have a panic attack and nothing will happen on time because the ramp is broken on the supposedly accessible building. You won't meet your benchmarks on time 
or ever. You won't be great, grateful to be included. We will want to be to set the agenda. And what our leadership looks like might include launching or crazy leaves, being not in public, or needing to empty an ostomy bag and being on bicycling all time, all the time. It is a slow. It's people, even the most social justice minded able folks stare at or get freaked out by. It looks like what you, it looks like what many mainstream able people have been taught to think of as failure. And that's disability justice. Right? So I can uh, take uh, some questions if they want. If not, I can also with other artistic people. So it, it looks like we don't have, I think, you know, I, I for one am just captivated by your ability to, um, you know, speak in such poetic ways that um, I think for, yeah, that, that evoke at least with me a very affective response that I'm just enjoying listening to you. <laughs> um, and I and I suspect the, the audience would be similar, but you know, I, I am I'm going to abuse my position as chair um, here and while there's a bit of a lull in conversation. And I just wonder, I know you engage a lot in theory and you really enjoy theory and specifically where you know you you mentioned about um, dying in IR, and I wonder if you, like, to what extent do you engage with theorists around affect and affective theory, um, and, and has that helped you navigate at all? Like, I'm thinking of um, immediately of Berlant's work of slow death, for example, um, to, to highlight, um, like Ali said, not, not necessarily just the um, structural violences and the impossibility of, of living in structures that were not designed for, for particular communities, but also um, illuminating um, hope, illuminating um, the ways in which we build communities otherwise. Um, and I wonder if, if, if you've engaged with any of that sort of literature or, or connected with that sort of theory. Yes and no. <laughs> um, so about affect, um, I, I have always conflicted emotions about affect theory because of how rooted I am in activism, right? And in material changes, right? And I, I think sometimes for me, the most interesting theories of emotions, of affects, of love, and I have written a lot about love. It's rooted on the ideas of, of action and needing to, to achieve also what the aesthetics looks like, right? So for me, it's all about the beauty on, on social transformation. It's about the beauty of, um, of, of feeling that you have achieved a change of all of these really material things, of even give food to people, right? and and all of all of these uh, material changes that I think sometimes is conflicted with some affect theories, not all of them, and I actually um, are really rooted and 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 interested in all of the Chicanos writing from Gloria Saldua, Chevy Moraga, and all of the people thinking like there about affect in, in different ways, but also in Latin America. Um, Chiovan Guerrero, Mac Magnus is, is a person that I follow closely, she's a trans woman, um, Valeria Flores, and, and as I said, you can check those papers, but my, my ideas are about uh, affect in relation to the construction of social change, but I think it's really important and, and to think about. Um, and also the bad emotions. I, I have written a lot about suicide, and, and actually the 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 the, the chapter that is going to come out is about the relation mostly of suicide and autism. So um, there's other layers there on bad effects that are really important to address and, and in a sense 
because I am writing about bad effects and actually writing that doesn't give any hope. In fact, the, the title of the book is The Banality of Surviving. <laughs> and in a sense, it's so, that. Oh, it looks like, um, oh, well, we you have a fan, you know, um, LB just said, thank you so very much um, for, for, for your presentation. So no, um, no questions yet that I can see. Um, yeah, um, gosh, this is um, such an emotionally moving presentation and discussion um, that, that um, I'm, you know, so grateful for your generosity, both you and Ali, for bringing such an uh, important conversation to the table and a lot for us to think through, a lot of and important politics that are um, engaged or that you engage with you, Lou. And I want to thank you and encourage you to, to, to keep going. And hopefully, I hope you consider FTGS a warm community for you um, to, to continue to engage with these discussions. And any um, publications that you come out, please do let us know. We'd love to promote that work as a section as well, too. Um, but you know, for the final few minutes, I guess, of the, the presentation, unless there's no questions, again, you have lots of fans. Everyone's coming saying thank you so much for this, um, this conversation. Um, oh, Natalia has a question, I guess. She says, hi, thank you so much for this talk. I'm ASD, Mexican, and also studying IR. I noticed you mentioned security studies, which is also what I'm interested in. Can I ask how your perspective has been different from other scholars of security? Sorry, it took so long to write this question. No problem, Natalie. Um, yeah, just asking you your, um, you know, your perspectives and how they might be different on security. Well, I think, <laughs> And, and this is quite a feminist response, right? So I think my questions are different, right? So I, I start by saying like, what are the security questions that people with autism care about uh, or might be, or what are the security questions that might be helpful and useful for uh, autistic folks, right? So for example, and, and this is not especially of autism, but it's about trauma. And I have a, a piece about trauma and, and poetry um, that it is about the need that we have about healing and how we might be healing through community writing in poetry. And I show there some poetry and how I built a community around that poem and through that poem that was important for me uh, to actually craft. So in a sense, one of the difficulties was that, for example, critical studies on, on security is a journal that has published poetry. But when I send the, the poems without any explanations, right? but I sometimes like to do that. Uh, they said that it wasn't a security uh, topic because nobody cared about what, uh, what the world feminists in, in, in that sense might think about um, as a security threat, perhaps, or as a security issue of having to survive within a really, really uh, dangerous world that translates into dangerous institutions that translate into dangerous living. Right? So in a sense, the questions that I am interested in are different, but also I think the type of responses are also a little bit different. The type of responses that I give are really quite material. <laughs> In a sense, and also really rooted in, I don't care, for example, and, and this might sound mean, but like, I don't really care about changing the name of, of, of what I studied the politics of medicine, <laughs> as for example, Ali, Ali does, I, I care about changing the politics of medicine, right? So, so in a sense, it is about this, this need of actual and material change. And love to connect too, like, I, I love to connect with any artistic person in, in IR. 
Great. Well, I um, want to take this time to, again, thank you, Lulu, and thank you, um, Ali, for um, evoking such important conversation um, and, and, and helping create a space where we can have these important conversations. And you, Leo, please do share your work. Um, it would be great for us as a section to more broadly um, um, uh, disseminate this amongst our section members and, 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 and beyond. And I look forward to seeing what else you're going to be um, uh, publishing, creative outlets or otherwise. It'd be great to see more of your work. So thank you um, again, Ali, for such a, a thoughtful and engaged reading of Julio's work. Um, and thank you also to the audience for um, coming and being, and being a part of this conversation and, um, and being a part of the series as well too. Um, before we go, I'm just going to put in the chat box there, the link to um, the further seminars that we have up until December. We have a few more that are coming up in January leading up to the ISA annual convention in Montreal. Um, so please do um, stay tuned. Um, and, um, and again, uh, Ulio, I'll give the last fleeting words to you before we, before we end this discussion. Well, before the last words is just thank you. Thank you for creating this space and thank you for this series. I think it's really, really important. All of the topics have been great and will continue to be great because I have read the, the schedule. Uh, but the last word will be that this is an ongoing conversation, right? So in my experience, this type of performances, these types of uh, presentations always lead to more thinking. And I love to receive late emails by people saying, this made me feel X, right? And it has been really great that people pick up in different ways um, the motivations that I'm bringing. And I have received emails about cancer, about uh, dealing with academia as well being a mother and a lot, of, a lot of different writings. And I always love to have these conversations. So feel free to reach. Um, and actually to continue the conversation and to act, right? So after all, what, what I'm looking for in this scholarship is to actually change the positions of people in this. And if you are an academic and you have the power of a classroom, I also love if, if you were to be interested in having a session in your classes about autism and what might be the possibilities uh, of, of healing through creative writing. So just reach out to and, and we can find that too. I have many activities and options to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Yulu. Thank, Thank you, you. audience. Um, have a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever in the world you might be. <laughs>